Since this is the first WWE Sins video involving the Thunderdome, I gotta remove five Sins because this was actually a very creative and well put idea. Sure, it has flaws, but everything has flaws. Regardless, it was a great idea to have fans virtually be a part of the show. It allows them to stay safe in our current circumstances and gives a feel of normality inside an arena with pyrotechnics again. The Sinner has spoken. I am the Chosen One. What an odd coincidence that Randy Orton, the supposed Chosen One, is taking on a guy who actually was referred to as the Chosen One. Was that supposed to be an infringement of Mackin rights? Because he doesn't do that anymore. You represent everything that is wrong with WWE. With all due respect, Drew, I will be the judge of what's wrong with WWE. After all, that's why I'm a god. This smoke! And the tag team division really needs a reconstruction badly, as Andrade and Angel Garza have been feuding with the Street Profits on and off for the better part of five months. Holy crap, this opening video refuses to end. With fans only virtually allowed to the arena, that gives more opportunities for pyrotechnics to explode, and that helps things feel a little more normal around here. Where we break the thunder tonight! Wah, wah. And not once, but twice tonight! I don't agree with Sasha Banks and Bayley being double champions each, and as a matter of fact, the WWE has had a creepy fetish for double champions recently. However, the women's tag team titles allow them to be part of both shows. Asuka, on the other hand, competing for both titles is a little too much. You will never see it coming. This pay-per-view's tagline is, you will never see it coming, which was hyped to the overload. I know that this show's ending was sudden and unexpected, but why revolve this entire show with that tagline? Also, personal opinion and no sin, I did a much better job at the you will never see it coming tagline when I brought back Hunter Bane, who ended up murdering Long Neck Josh coincidentally at last year's SummerSlam Sins video. Given how Bailey's graphics are looking, have we been wrong about her name this whole time and she's actually changed it to Bailey? Should I call her Bay going forward? Probably not, given a lot of perverts likely call her that already. Bailey was defeated by Naomi in the Beat the Clock Challenge. Which raises a question. The ruling of a Beat the Clock Challenge is that a wrestler must end the match prior to the time running out. Even though Bailey was defeated by Naomi, the match ended before the time expired and she technically lasted shorter than Sasha Banks did, thus beating the clock. So why doesn't Sasha go first tonight? Everything is not what it seems between Banks and Bailey. Corey Gray is taking Kayla Braxton's place of being the annoying dick who's constantly probing for Sasha and Bailey to break up and feud. It eventually happens, but stop making it so obvious. WWE Payback. WWE is shitting out pay-per-views literally a week after the previous one just to piss me off and overflow my sin schedule. Challenge accepted, bitches. Oh, and a drop. Dang, even if Asuka never connected to dropkick, Bailey's leapfrog was extremely weak and wouldn't have helped her. All right, now look at this submission attack. Seeing the screen falter is the only time Retribution makes any sort of impact tonight at SummerSlam despite being a mysterious focus of the last few weeks, and that's such a letdown. Also, if that wasn't actually Retribution, then WWE's Thunderdome is like a brand new update added to Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout. So many glitches and bugs. Guys, remember champion's advantage. Sasha Banks is yelling at the referee to look at Bailey's foot hanging on the rope, not realizing that the referee actually did notice and was counting Asuka to let go. Later. Ouch, the way Bailey hit the ground from that DDT and her scream of pain immediately upon impact was so well done. Here's a sin off. Cover by the champ. Wait, what? Asuka is a champion too? I get that all the women's gold in the main roster is present in this match, but Asuka is the one who's actually holding none of them, Michael. Begging for mercy. Also, Asuka somehow falls for this. Bailey and her continued feud with Michael Cole. Please don't get Michael involved in feuds again. Wasn't it bad enough that he was a main focus of WrestleMania so many years ago? Oh, oh, Bailey to Bailey. Oh, Bailey. Asuka kicks it to it. Unfortunately, the Bailey to Bailey move no longer has a finishing effect on opponents because she's a villain. And Asuka, uh By saying all of it, Sasha Banks unintentionally just jinxed Bailey's momentum and made her connect none of it. Oh, Bailey's gonna attack. And now Michael Cole reversed Bailey's Jinx momentum by Jinx and Asuka's momentum. Why do the commentators keep insisting something's going to happen when it never does 95% of the time? Yeah! And now look at this! Yes, I get that Sasha wanted to get involved to prevent Bailey from losing the SmackDown Women's Championship. However, she's got to remember that she herself is going to face Asuka later on in the night and risking prior damage is a bad strategy. Also, just by the distraction alone, it makes it obvious that Bailey's going to attempt to do the same thing for Sasha later on in the night, and it will backfire. It's a movie I've watched so many times. Uh, Post-Match Assault, another movie I have seen countless times. It's got way too many sequels, to be honest. Dad. I don't mean to interrupt this tender father-son moment, but I can't be the only one who notices the glitches all over the screen, right? Why are there so many hints that Retribution is causing more damage and it doesn't pay off at SummerSlam, the biggest event of the summer? I need you to promise me 
but you're not going to get involved. Rey Mysterio immediately ignores that promise. Three minutes of watching recaps of Retribution caused an annihilation. You know what? Since WWE chose not to capitalize on anything involving the group tonight and instead did absolutely nothing after this recap, here's 15 more sins. If you want some dangerous faction causing mayhem, do it right! Kevin Owens is out here to provide commentary for the Raw Tag Team Championship match because... Actually, I don't even know why he's out here. Andrade and Angel Garza have had their issues lately, and Monday Night Raw is lacking in the tag team division. So naturally, the first thing that comes to mind is to split them up. That is not good shit. Summer Slam is presented by... Even in the Thunderdome, you will still get skipped. Oh, look at this! So Gotta love the Street Profits and the Red Solo Cup Pyrotechnics. That was a cool addition to their entrance. Not gonna lie, these side screen promos are getting kind of annoying, especially when the referee has raised the Raw Tag Team Championship belts and is about to start the freaking match. Get any kind of retribution. There are so many references to retribution, and tonight we get anything but retribution. Here's another 10 cents. Stop doing this with no promises. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Gotta be impressed with the athleticism of Montez Ford, and Zelena Vega's oh my god reaction was a perfect addition, too. Even with the whole poisoning situation. Andrade looks to toss Montez Ford outside the ring, but awkwardly gets him tangled up on the ropes. Staring and yelling at the camera? Haven't I seen enough of that from the AEW Double or Nothing Sins already? Apparently not. He's got Ford tagged with the oh, good. Tom Phillips doesn't sound like he's having a good night, does he? I'm wearing your shirt, Dawkins! Come on! To be perfectly honest, I don't like the idea of Kevin Owens being a cheerleader at the commentary table. Where's the Kevin Owens that ruled in 2015? Apparently, we need an additional ring creator for backstage interviews now. What's next, an interview match? But you know what else I'm going to love? Being able to actually retain the Raw Women's title for once in your life. Payback has returned, and it's being sponsored by- <gasps> You! Shit, don't say, don't say, don't say it. You retired that sin, just move on. Although I wonder, what's the point of having a main roster pay-per-view literally seven days after the previous main roster pay-per-view? You only have one edition of Raw and SmackDown to make matches and start the storylines. Why couldn't this have been the September pay-per-view or something? It's bad enough that the men's division is running low on tag teams, but the women's division has been lacking on tag teams since the inauguration of their tag team titles. Why do we insist on breaking up so many teams? And the loser leaves WWE! We interrupt SummerSlam 2020 to bring you the feud between Layla and Michelle McCool at Extreme Rules 2011. Sonya Deville must have forgotten her ring gear and was given an old jacket from Woken Matt Hardy that was left behind before he himself departed. It makes a lot of sense. Actually, it doesn't. The whole feud was leading up to one of these ladies getting their head shaved and was only switched to the loser leaving the company at the last second. Sonya Deville said, what a devastating punch to the air. The knees into the midsection of what the hell? Mandy Rose is not even reacting to any of the punches that Sonya Deville has given her. Three punches in a row and Mandy isn't even moving at the slightest. Oh, if only Mandy was a few steps ahead of where she was when she connected the suplex, Sonya would have completely hit the steel instead of missing it and it would have been a cool moment. But alas. And I'm Mandy Sorry, but the moment Sonya had to run forward to receive the clothesline, you know it got ruined by poor placement. Remember, no disqualification. There it is. Was hoping we could sneak through this no disqualification match without hearing the obvious statements about the match, but I expect too much, I suppose. Or maybe Sonya Deville drove Mandy. And now I face palm for the tenth time of this match after watching Mandy struggle to set up the table. Hell, the referee was even telling her how to set it up. Also, this doesn't even pay off because Mandy struggles for nearly a minute to set up a table that inevitably is left alone and forgotten about for the rest of this match. Unloading with the rights and lefts as he tries to mount. Michael Cole must be gender confused because he referred to Mandy as a he. Yikes, I'm surprised Corey Graves hasn't hit him since he has a tendency to praise Mandy as God's greatest creation. Look at Mandy. <sighs> You've got to be kidding me. Either the WWE's production of the pay-per-view suddenly blacked out or Retribution once again did something with no effect to the event. Sorry for bringing it up again, it's just pissing me the fuck off. This is all you got! Sonya Deville starts monologuing and ends up costing herself the match in her career in WWE. The table's on Mandy Rose! Next to monologue, and the other thing that cost Sonya Deville her career in WWE is copy Rose infringement. Sonya Deville has to leave! No surprise, considering the wrestler who usually races the stakes with a Loser Leaves Town match is also the one who falls victim to said stipulation. The one time we see Otis run to the ring with the Money in the Bank briefcase is also the one time that no champion is present in the area. The build-up to Dominic Mysterio making his in-ring debut against Seth Rollins in the street fight was intense, especially with this scene of Dominic getting lashed by candlesticks in such a terrifying moment. I got a lot of respect for this kid. Man, Seth Rollins is such an asshole with the attire worn by Rey Mysterio over 20 years ago in WCW. I love it. Great heel work. 
Earlier, Dominic told Rey Mysterio to not get involved with his debut match, which of course is immediately forgotten of. If I were Dominic, I would have told Rey to stay backstage during the match. Then it would definitely test the father's trust in his son to get the job done. Rollins staring down Rey Mysterio. What? There is no way in hell that Tom Phillips could confuse Rey and Dominic Mysterio apart. Dominic is the one competing against Seth Rollins, and he's not wearing a mask. That was so bad. What's up with Dominic having a hood attached to his ring gear? In moments like this, the hood will go over his head and sometimes over his face. It's worthless to have in a wrestling match. Entrance? Sure. In the match? Why? Talk back there, quick. This is your kid. I get that Dominic Mysterio is having his in-ring debut tonight, but it's still a bad idea for Seth Rollins to take him lightly. Since we're mostly using kendo sticks in this match and in the build-up to tonight, it would make a lot more sense if this was a kendo stick match instead of a street fight. Match stipulations should really relate to the hype up. You get involved? Seth Rollins is such an idiot in this match. Oh, and Dominic. See what I mean about that hood? Keeps getting in the way. Who knows, Dominic might be a secret leader of Retribution or that hacker guy. Given how slow Seth takes his time and how much he underestimates Dominic's wrestling abilities, I think I figured out why this match is nearly 30 minutes long. Perhaps he's trying to make this 30 minutes on purpose. What is this, AEW? I'll put it into it then. More of the Thunderdome screens blanking out. Forget Fall Guys, there are more bugs and glitches to this system than WWE 2K20. Uh, Ow, my hands! WWE's audio technicians really need to work on their timing, as the crowd noise for Dominic kicking out came too late. Sorry, try again next time. Yes! Seth Rollins calls for Murphy to pull out a table. Here's the hope that Murphy will have an easier job setting it up than Mandy Rose did earlier. And what do you bet it's the exact same table Mandy pulled out but never used? Perhaps the reason this event's tagline is you'll never see it coming is because WWE is making sure we literally can't see what's going on. Fix your shit! Serial has to look on! Seth continues to annoyingly shout at Rey Mysterio about how everything is his fault. Well, once Dominic counters and puts you through a table, it'll be your own dumbass fault. Are we positive that Dominic is the rookie wrestler here? It's either Dominic is the dick or Seth is a dick to his own Rollins for constantly taking his eye off the ball. Wait, maybe I shouldn't mention eyes around Rey Mysterio here. Seth Rollins is Dominic grabs a chair to use and then decides to throw it into the ring, where a recovering Seth can use it to his own advantage. It's a nice addition, but given Angie Mysterio doesn't really do anything or help Dominic win the match, I think she was better off backstage. Oh, Good on Ray to prevent Dominic from losing his eye, but I got us in the moment because Ray disobeyed the promise he gave Dominic about not getting involved in any way, shape, or form, which includes dealing with Murphy. I'm just saying. Dominic Mysterio you can clearly see that Seth Rollins connected his knee against the stairs, but not even five seconds later is miraculously healed. Maybe that's why he runs a school on how to sell injuries, where he basically tells the students, don't sell at all. Man, I got chills watching this conclusion. Ray helplessly trying to reach his fallen son as Seth taunts him. The taunting only works if you have your opponent at bay, and this was almost heartbreaking to watch. Well done to everyone involved. Given Sasha Banks and her history defended the Raw Women's Championship in her four previous reigns, simply replace B with L, spelling lost time, and the CGI graphic would be more appropriate. I suppose, since Bailey is wearing both women's tag team championship belts around her waist, she is the women's tag team champions all by herself, hogging all the glory, and somehow she's the one jealous of Sasha? Oh crap, I forgot about the downside of so many pyrotechnics. There's a lot of resulting smoke, which makes it really difficult to see what's going on. And this match is brought to you by Missing Cup Who cares? <laughs> Bailey takes some attacks from Asuka and goes on to successfully retain her SmackDown Women's Championship. Meanwhile, Sasha Banks takes some attacks from Asuka and is already set to call it a night. Kick to the side. Actually, Sasha connected a 619, the exact same way Dominic did to Seth in the previous match. Let me guess, the only reason you're not calling it a 619 is because Sasha is not a Mysterio. Move is still the same. Landing on the injury oh, leg, oh, and now the right leg. Holy shit! Asuka kicked the ring post with all her might, causing damage to her foot. But then a few seconds later, she's able to put weight on the same injured foot, no problem. She must have attended the Seth Rollins School of Learning How to Sell Injuries. Ouch! I literally felt that when I watched this event the first time, and while writing Sins, I felt it again. This was a terrifying moment of the match for sure. But right now it's boss time. Oh come on, Joe! I was happy knowing Michael Cole wasn't out here to commentate this match and say his annoying catchphrase. But why you? Why Joe? WWE! Wow, that was a creative code breaker by Sasha Banks. Just when it looks like all hope is lost for her, BAM! And a desperation moment! Sasha Banks is so desperate to win this match that she's resorting to grabbing Bailey by her ears. Either that or she's got an ear fetish. This side. 
Man, WWE must have a crazy obsession with Sasha Banks being the most unsuccessful women's champion of all time. Five Raw titles and not a single retain on record. She wins the title and then loses it to the exact same person she won it from on her first defense less than a month later. Five times in a row, five sins. Also, if this was always going to be Sasha's fate, what was the point of having Asuka lose the Raw Women's title to her in the first place? And by count out, too. When you think about it, this is literally 2019 on repeat. The current WWE Champion, who achieved his decade-long dream at WrestleMania, is defending his title against Randy Orton at the following SummerSlam event in a match that ends out of nowhere and continues to the Clash of Champions event in September. The only difference is Drew McIntyre. Pissed off six foot five Scottish fire breathing dragon. A pissed off six five Scottish fire breathing dragon? Holy shit! Drew McIntyre's promo work and his demeanor is absolutely outstanding. I don't believe in dragons myself, and said Kaiba is gonna get pissed at me for saying that, but that promo was enough to make me believe he could spit fire. Damn. Honestly, Randy Orton staring at the screens of the Thunderdome is a lot more awkward when you realize that those on the screens can't exactly see the action from the screen's perspective, but rather the perspective we're looking at right now. Kind of a good thing it's like that, otherwise I'd hate to be one of those poor bastards whose faces aren't even shown over the barricade. So, in other words, Shawn Michaels was doing his best impersonation of Mufasa? Since when did Drew McIntyre become the Lion King? Holy shit! Defeated the Beast Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania in record time! Oh. And by record time, we mean Drew beat Brock Lesnar in a Brock wants to get the fuck out of WWE amount of time. Also, heel wrestler immediately retreats out of the ring upon the bell ringing to start the match cliche. Oh boy, here we go again. Ah! Oh, oh, into the barricade! Into the barricade? Since when did the ring post get renamed a barricade, Tom? That was a hilarious fail. Title is coming home with me. Well, if you keep hanging out on the table outside the ring while the referee's counting you guys out, then it's safe to say the WWE title is going nowhere. Randy Orton just stalking. Drew McIntyre's recovering and getting back to his feet, so that definitely means it's time to pose the shit out of those arms. Doctor to the WWE Championship. Oh, 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 oh. Another horrible situation of crowd noises. WWE knows full well that any time a wrestler locks in the figure for a leg lock, the crowd starts saying woo in homage to Ric Flair. You couldn't have at least put in that sound effect to make it sound believable. Every ounce of disrespect. Oh come on, the referee didn't disqualify Randy Orton for putting his hands on him? I guess the rumors are true about WWE trying to copy AEW. In this case, showing how incompetent the referees are. Also, Randy grabs the referee and risks losing the chance to win the WWE Championship from Drew McIntyre, all just so he can poke him in the eye. The Future Shock DDT likely did not finish off Drew's opponents like it used to because he's no longer the future of WWE. He's the present. Probably should have called it a present Shock DDT. While most did not agree with this ending, I did. If Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton were going to be continuing their feud after tonight, then it makes sense to have Drew get a sneaky escape win. That way, Drew retains the title, Randy doesn't lose his momentum, and gets even more pissed, adding a new chapter to the story. It's called storytelling, folks! The most important thing about professional wrestling, whether you like it or not. Getting Alexa Bliss involved in this feud made The Fiend even more frightening than it already was. It's just a shame she didn't get involved with this actual Falls Count Anywhere match. If only the build up paid off at SummerSlam instead of later on. Fuck, I'm removing five sins. That dark red silhouette of The Fiend's face looking right at me was almost as frightening as the first time I laid eyes on it when The Fiend debuted at last year's SummerSlam in my kingdom of Toronto. If you have a weak stomach, turn away because- <laughs> <laughs> Michael Cole actually went down the you can't handle this if you don't have a strong stomach route to a match that will most definitely be easy to watch. At times, impervious to pain. At times? Try all the freaking time, Corey. This psychotic thing is still impervious to pain. Just because it lost once or twice doesn't mean it's not impervious to pain. We've seen The Fiend use this in the past. Actually, the only time The Fiend was ever near a toolbox was when Seth Rollins brutally annihilated it inside that god-awful Hell in a Cell match last year. <laughs> Yikes, I knew The Fiend wasn't it, but I never knew The Fiend was THE it. Maybe that's why it's invincible. Where's the losers club when you need them? Now with a choke slam! Ah, the table didn't smash properly. How the hell is, is The Fiend on his feet? After everything The Fiend has been through since last year's SummerSlam, why is it surprising that it is still on its feet? Hell in a Cell, Crown Jewel, Survivor Series, literally every time The Fiend competes, it is invincible. Yes, that includes after it lost to Goldberg, as it was not affected. I couldn't be the only one who noticed that the red lights were surrounding this area the moment these two entered, right? Very nice touch to show that the presence of The Fiend still triggers the red lights to this day. Strolling with hammer fists, this is- 
Man, Braun Strowman is going to town on that ring canvas. Those are some nasty shots. Maybe that's why those with a weak stomach can't handle this match. I'm gonna throw up from the brutality. Braun Strowman gains possession of a box cutter, and I personally thought he was gonna perform some Evil Dead type shit, but instead he wastes his time cutting the ring canvas, which leads to his defeat. Strowman just realized. Oh no! Because the fiend's already dead. And no, I don't mean it in the way those crying, whiny podcasters say the fiend is dead. Ron has his arm up in the air to prevent himself from getting pinned and still gets pinned anyway. Oh my god, what the hell? Who the hell? Well, fuck. WWE got me there. Something I did not see coming was Roman Reigns returning after being absent due to the pandemic and Roman Reigns turning heel at the same time. Still doesn't excuse why the entire show was based off that tagline, but I'll deduct 10 cents for a job well done on living up to it.